Well, good afternoon to our CLA family members, clients, community partners, and friends. Welcome back to the live stream. Today, I'm so excited because we're coming together to talk about tax planning and preparation considerations for our business owner friends in the community. And to help us identify and understand these issues, my friend is with us, um, and she is the national leader of our business owner solutions team, Tammy Neal. Welcome, Tammy. Thank you, Jen. It is so great to have you here, my friend. I've been excited for this all day. Um, but Tammy, before we get started, we're going to go quickly through our housekeeping items for our guests who are joining us. Um, for all of you out there, I'd like to urge you to subscribe to the CLA YouTube channel and hit that like button on the live stream so they're easy to find and you're notified of them in the future. In addition to our live streams, we've got some great specialized webinars for you going on already in 2022 and planned going forward. So to stay up to date on these offerings, please just be sure to check out our events page on CLAConnect.com and then subscribe to receive future invitations from us. When you visit our events page, you can also register to find other relevant events very specific and, and dialed into yourself and your organizations. So you might want to do that while you're continuing to engage with your advisors here who are going to be presenting you with white papers, articles, um, all kinds of touch points. So at the very least, if you have questions, hit that contact us button. We want to hear from you and engage with you. So uh, we're looking forward to continuing these discussions going forward. Now, Tammy, after um, lots of conversation between you and me in the past couple of days and, you know, things that we've seen over our careers, we're going to talk about some of the technical issues that are really relevant for business owners while we're together and as part of their tax planning and conversations with their advisors. But I'd like for you to start us off with a little bit of context. When you and I, you know, were talking, we talked about how we both really made our careers working with business owners from just a strategic planning point of view. You know, in my world is centering around investments in people and the tax credits and savings associated with that. But your world really looks at the whole picture through the advisory lens, right? From inception to growth planning to succession considerations. So what I was hoping you could do before we, we dial into the details, that you could just talk to me about your experiences and why we tend to begin our conversations at this macro level when we're talking to our business owners. Sure. So um, I focus on the individuals. So there, for most of our clients, because CLA focuses on closely held businesses, normally we're dealing with pass-through entities, so partnerships or entities taxed as S corporations. And so it's very important that we are not just focusing on the business tax return, but we're focusing on the ultimate taxpayer and how we can minimize their income tax, their estate tax, their overall tax picture. And so what's important is that we start our conversations with the end in mind. And so what I would recommend for someone who is going to say own real estate is going to be completely different than what I would recommend for someone who has a consulting business. So starting with the end in mind is very important in these discussions and how we advise um, our clients to set up their entity. So uh, did I answer your question? You sure did. Okay. And, you know, and thinking about that, there are so many different ways that just based on those examples, right? Whether you whether your end game is owning real estate or kind of what it is you're looking at, can you give me a few examples of how we at CLA can come alongside the business owners to really capture that end goal and the success of that end goal? Absolutely. So um, business owners are going to need different things at different stages. So if I have a young entrepreneur that comes in, regardless of the industry, um, I'm going to talk to them about life insurance. So we've got CLA Wealth Advisory. I'm going to talk to them about um, their, their key employees and their accounting team. Maybe they need just some temporary accounting help until they find the person. We have CLA search that can help them put a controller or CFO in place or can help them find an accounting team. But our biz ops team can help them, you know, with temporary help or just if they just need a few hours a month or a week, whatever. So what they need at the beginning, then in the growth stage, you know, now maybe we have instead of a simple, now maybe we have a 401k with a profit sharing plan. Um, we're also going to be bringing in our uh, gift estate and tax experts 
to talk to them because if you've got a company that's rapidly growing, maybe we want to talk about getting some of that growth out of their estate before, you know, they have a liquidity event. And then obviously, you know, then it becomes time because we're not going to all live and work forever. It comes time to exit the business. And what does that look like? Does it go to a new family member or a, you know, a younger generation? Does it go to a private equity? Um, lots of different ways that that can play out, but we would then bring in our owner transition services to help them determine whether they're financially ready, emotionally ready, and what they can do to improve the value of their of their business. Yeah, Tammy, that is really such a great overview of all the ways that, you know, we're here to come alongside those business owners. And I love the way you structure it from, you know, planning to being in the now to what do we do from succession base. So what I want to do really for our, the rest of our time together is dial into the now, at least for, for the bulk of it, right? And so mm-hmm. one of the things I heard you say is like, we need to solidify our foundation for long-term growth. And so... I want to start this technical piece of the conversation with an overview of that net investment income tax because I think that's really relevant to a lot of what business owners are facing right now. So could you could you start us off with that, please? Sure. So the net investment income tax was part of the legislation that passed when um, President Obama was in office, and it's a 3.8 percent surtax that applies to passive income from businesses. There was, um, it was in the proposed legislation, the Build Back Better, that it was going to change where it would apply to also non-passive income from businesses below or above a certain dollar amount, which was about $450,000. But fortunately, that appears to be dead. That legislation appears to be dead. So that won't come into play for the non-passive side. So it's just going to still apply to passive income. So if you've got someone, say, who has already retired from their business and they're living or exited their business or just even retired as an employee, um, that 3.8% still will come into play if they're if they're passive income, dividends, interest, rents, um, or over the $250,000 for a married filing joint couple. So it is still relevant for passive income. Okay, I think that's really helpful and something that probably is confusing for some people, but but I think it's important for, for everybody to keep that piece in mind. So another layer to this that also applies to some of these business owners is, and, and frankly confuses me sometimes are the excess business loss rules. So, uh, you know, I was wondering if you could talk about that as well and maybe how business owners are using those to offset the IRA income. Sure. So that that is one strategy. So let me just uh, step back and talk about what excess business losses are. So that was part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that put that into place to limit losses from businesses. Um, so again, for our pass through businesses or self employment, like if you are a Schedule C sole proprietor, it would limit losses to five hundred thousand for married filing joint, two hundred and fifty thousand for single or married filing separate. So that was put into place. Then COVID happened. The CARES Act um, suspended that. So it was a, and it was part, it was a provision that was going to sunset in 2025 anyway, um, but it was suspended for 2018 through 2020. So for 2021, which is the tax year that we're filing taxes for now, um, it, we, we have that limit. Okay. So it's no longer su- su- suspended. So for 21 and now as we're, we're into 2022, this would be an opportunity because we have that limit that I would look at possibly converting an IRA, a traditional IRA account to a Roth if I had excess losses, because I cannot deduct more than 500,000 of losses, that would be a year. And we've used this strategy to convert over a million dollars in traditional IRA accounts for clients without having to pay any tax. So that's just one strategy where you can use those excess business losses. And when you have control over a business, and we'll go into some of those types of items in a few minutes, but It allows you to make decisions at the business level, you know, where you you can create or you can manage your adjusted gross income 
at your 1040 level by making decisions at the business level. Interesting. And I think that's I think that's an area that's so worth covering, right? Because like I said, even I was confused because of it was suspended and brought back and you know, when are people using it? So I like I like the way you're using those rules to create a good strategy, right? So I think that's I think that's super helpful ex explanation there, Tammy. Um, the other area too, so so when we talk about the excess business loss rules, we also talk about the businesses that are in the NOL position and and how the rules around that moved moved with the um, tax cuts and jobs and the CARES Act, right? So, I so wondering if you could maybe unpack that a little bit for us too, just the NOL carryback rules. Sure. So net operating losses. Um, I mean, in simple terms, you have deductions or losses in a business that exceed the income or revenue from a business. So when they flow through to the 1040, pre-Tax Cuts and Jobs Act legislation, which passed in December of 2017, we could carry net operating losses back two years and then forward, or you could forego the carry back and just carry forward. When the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed, we could no longer carry back, we could only carry forward. So then again, COVID happened. So in 2020, um, legislation was passed that allowed us to carry NOLs back five years, which was substantial because those were tax years where our, cl our clients were paying taxes at the maximum tax bracket of 39.6. Plus, they could have the 3.8% Medicare surtax also. And then you have clients who are in, I'm not in a state that has an income tax, but there's clients that are in, have uh, high income tax states. So, you know, so you've got a lot of layers of taxes. So if we were able to carry net operating losses back to those years, we were generating substantial refunds quickly for our clients. So again, there were some great strategies where we were able to take accelerated depreciation, create net operating losses, carry them back and generate cash immediately for the for the taxpayers. So, yeah. So, um so now for 2021 though, we're done with this grace that we had from the CARES Act and we're back to only being able to carry forward. I think that's helpful to understand as well because I know there were a lot of our folks and clients really who are who are coming to us saying help me help me in any way you can generate generate tax savings right or say, bring dollars in and so this was I think a great and often an, often not overlooked but it was a little bit less publicized than say ERC and PPP right like I mean if you could take advantage of those NOL rules um, I think it really helped a lot of our, our business owners and so I think it's good to understand that but to understand where things stand right now so thank you for that explanation um, I want to get into one last kind of super technical area before we we come back a little bit more you know pull back and zoom out a little bit more and that last thing is the bonus depreciation and just trying to ask you to help us understand where that stands in 2022. Okay, so um, again, from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, a lot of this legislation was created and bonus depreciation um, is where we're able to take 100% of the cost of an asset and write it off immediately. You can elect out. And so this is where we have some kind of control to manage our or taxable income, you can elect out of classes. If you have five-year property or seven-year property, you could elect to do it just on one or elect, and elect out on another class, um, but it allows you to write off 100%. And so that is what gives us some opportunity to create losses. And again, that was for 2018 through 2020. So maybe going forward, we don't want to elect to do bonus. We want to elect out of it. Um, so that we're not creating these losses and we're just going to take the depreciation over the pro rata, you know, life. So um, anyway, but for 2022, it's the amount is still 100%. In 2023, it's scheduled to go back to 80% or go down to 80%. So it's going to start decreasing. So 2022 right now, unless there's further legislation, it's still at 100%. 
Yeah, always the question, right? What's going to pop up next on the legislative? Yeah, year? my crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's why we have the live stream to begin with. It's where it was born. So right. <laughs> never mind it, but uh, it definitely throws a wrench in things. Well, Tammy, thank you for that. Like, I think that really helps cover some of these technical areas for the business itself. I want to dig in a little bit more on the business owner while we have you with us today. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have a lot of planning opportunities available for wealth transfer with the charitable gifting and estate planning. That's another area that we've talked about for these owners. And I'm wondering if you could tell me some key opportunities that are just essential for a business owner to be aware of as they enter this 2021 return filing season and the 2022 planning season. So fortunately, Congress took a lot, most of the estate planning um, cha potential changes out of the legislation. So we we each, each individual has um, a $12 million, $60,000 lifetime exemption of that they can transfer wealth to another individual without paying any wealth transfer tax. The tax rate is 40%. So if um, I, so if I prematurely die and I have a $20 million estate, and I've not used any of my lifetime exemption, essentially I have 40% tax on $8 million on that excess. So $3.2 million of my estate will go to the IRS, to Uncle Sam. If I'm able to do planning now, before I'm a business owner and before my business grows to the value of $20 million, let's say I right now it's, let's say it's $10 million and I take, five million of it and I put it into a trust for my children. Now, fast forward, that was half of my my ownership. Now that 10 million is out of my estate because it's five and it doubled to 10 and I still have 10 million in my estate. So now I'm dealing with a different number, a different calculation. So it's really important if you have a business that's rapidly growing, there's opportunities to get some of that out of your estate because we still have this $12 million exemption. The other um, planning piece is that there are simple things that you can do because we're not all worth 15 or $20 million. There are simple things that you can do. The annual exclusion is $16,000. So I can give $16,000 to you. I can give $16,000 to you know each of my neighbors um, and it doesn't create any wealth transfer filing, a, a gift tax return and no, no tax. So anytime I go, someone exceeds that $12 million number in their lifetime, it's going to be subject to 40% tax. So just lots of opportunity because we are seeing lots of liquidity events right now as the baby boomers are wanting to retire and it's transitioning. Like I said, we're even seeing very young entrepreneurs um, you know, being offered lot large sums of money by private equity or um, strategic buyers. So it's really important um, that we're having those conversations about the opportunities to get that exponential growth out of their taxable estate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I know that I, along with many of our audience members, will be happy to send you our mailing address for the $15,000 <laughs> check. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I think it's a great idea. So, well, the uh, second piece I was going to, so I, I'm okay. sorry, I didn't answer the second piece of your question, which was on the charitable side. Yes. So, that is another opportunity. Again, if you're a business owner, there's opportunities to use charities or um, what one vehicle that I like to use is a donor advised fund, which is qualifies as a 501c3 charity and you can qualify for the 50% deduction. But if you want 50% of your AGI limit, just to not, I guess, pull back from some of the technical, um, but it allows you to put stock, so S-Corp stock, LLC units, real estate, it allows you to put things into um, the Stoner Advice Fund, and then you can you get the deduction immediately for the fair market value, but you can take as long as you want to distribute that. And a lot of the donor advice funds that I work with will they'll you give them a non-voting interest in your business so they're not selling your stock they're holding it and they're taking distributions and then that those distributions are what you use to then fund multiple charities of your choice and over the term of your choice 
So in doing that also, before you have a liquidity event, gets that gain out of your income tax world and gets funds into the charity. So you're getting the gain out of your income tax world and you're getting a deduction for the fair market value up front for the value that you donated. So there's a lot of good strategy around using a charitable vehicle with your business interests. Again, CLA focuses on closely held businesses and a lot of our clients, their wealth is tied up in their business, but they have charitable intentions And so this is one way to help them accomplish their charitable goals um, and save tax at the same time. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, you know, and and the more forward thinking you can be with this stuff, I think the better off you are. And I know we've talked about that often, um, you know, just even in preparation for this. So we do have some good questions coming in for the audience. Before, Before I pull those in, I just wouldn't kind of, Parting question I have for you on almost like the technical side is, have you ever thought about or have you ever been able to quantify the cost of kind of not thinking through these strategies and not doing it? Like ultimately, what does the cost of not planning with these intentions entail for the business owner? Um, I can give you examples. Um, there are numerous, unfortunately, uh, where we've had clients come to us with not enough time to plan. Um, I had a gentleman exit his business for $198 million. He wanted to benefit key employees, but it the, he came to us after the, transa- the transaction. So the employees ended up getting money only, he could only do a bonus in their W-2. And it was significant funds that he wanted to transfer to these key employees. So unfortunately, there was nothing that we could do to try to create that to be capital gain for them. So it was all taxes, ordinary income. Um, So it's significant, Uh, you know, it just depends on the size of the transaction. And obviously, I mean, whether we're talking about income tax or estate tax, it's um, we don't we don't want people to be penny wise and dollar foolish because it really uh, an ounce of prevention, you know, it, it just. It, it can be very costly by not yeah. planning with the end in mind. I mean, it just can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is the statement? An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So <laughs> I think you're right there. Well, Tammy, um, I just want to dive into a few of these questions. I know we're we're coming up on our last 10 minutes here, but um, we've got two pretty good questions um, popping up on my screen from our audience. The first one is, can an accrual basis calendar year C corporation deduct year end um, expenses that are paid by March 15th. That so that is the rule that they have to be paid by March 15th. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So So yes. Okay. I think I think that's a quick and clear question. Then the other thing has to go to the sixteen thousand dollar you know conversation that we were having. That was can you give a personal gift of sixteen thousand dollars to one of your key employees? You can. you know, I mean, it, I think if if you were audited, it does have the smell that it should be compensation. Um, but but you are allowed to give sixteen thousand dollars to whoever you want to without any. It, that is a wealth transfer tax exclusion, the sixteen thousand dollars. But it does have if you're giving it to your key employees, it does kind of walk and talk like it's compensation. But there isn't that which is really the it's a payroll tax. Um, issue, but I, I I would say yes that okay. you can without any um, payroll tax, without any wealth transfer tax or income tax. I mean, you've got all these different taxes that you're dealing with, but yes, I think that that's fine. Okay, it's a good answer. Not not exactly the one I was expecting, to be honest. So, um, you know, a great question coming in from um, from the audience there. So we appreciate their engagement, Tammy. Before we wrap up. Um, you know, as as we've been talking about, you and I have had a lot of years in this business and, you know, made a lot of observations. Do you have any key thoughts that just, again, like I said, before we close, just to share with this group engaged in, in this, any, any key thoughts that you'd like for them to take away um, as a result of this conversation that we had today? Sure. Um, it's important to surround yourself with a good team. So, you know, it isn't just... Um, 
the one relationship at CR the, uh, at CLA because CLA has so many different advisors that they can bring in, and it's important to have the conversations about your family, your family goals, your business, the business goals. It's important to talk about life insurance. It's important to talk about, you know, again, the end and what what everything looks like for you. And not everybody that creates massive amounts of wealth wants all of the wealth to go to their family, you know, to the to the um, their lineal descendants. Sometimes they want a lot to go to charity. So it's important to really get things documented um, and fund these trusts, if you create trusts, I mean, they're just a great vehicle to use. So it's important to have your documents in place, have your beneficiaries updated, um, and to be strategic and look at maybe a five-year forecast. Don't just look at, okay, we're doing 2021 tax returns right now, so that's all I'm going to focus on. Let's plan and be strategic because there are things that we can do for 2022 that even impact, impact 2021. So it's not too late to do a SEP IRA. There's mm-hmm. things that we can do to lower our 2021 income still. So it's just important to be having discussions that include like maybe a five-year forecast because a lot of the legislation that passed at the end of 2017 will sunset at the end of 2025. So I would be looking, you know, maybe into 2026 in all of my discussions because tax rates are going to go up and they're not going to go down. And so it, I just think it's important to kind of have a bigger picture um, mm-hmm. in the discussions and not be short-sighted, particularly for our business owners. Well, and I think that's so important to remember. I think, you know, given the changing legislative landscape that we've experienced in the last couple of years, a lot of people are afraid to be too forward thinking. And so I like you reiterating, hey, look, not everything is uncertain, right? Not everything, we can't just throw it all over the wall and say, well, it could change next year. Something else could be passed. I mean, yes, that's true, but there are some mindful strategic moves that we can make, especially when you look at, you know, here at CLA, all of CLA that we have to offer from a wealth advisory standpoint, from business transition, succession modeling, charitable gifting, you know, those types of needs, I think, as, as you think broader than just your 2021 tax return, overall the business owners will benefit. So um, so thank you for solidifying that uh, vision. So anyway, Tammy, I really wanna thank you for your time today. I think your, your guidance was fantastic. Um, I love the questions um, from the audience. And actually, as I'm wrapping up, I might just sneak in this one last question, if that's okay, just pop sure. up. So um, somebody said, will a check for $16,000 does someone trigger a flag through the bank's need to report transactions over certain dollar amounts? No, the bank has a requirement to report cash transactions over $10,000, so not a check. Okay. And then one more. Look at our audience today engaging right at that last second. Um, Is gifting of life insurance premiums held in the trust still allowed? It is. And so, again, part of the proposed legislation back in September would have prevented uh, grantors putting money into an irrevocable life insurance trust. That was gonna be prohibited. It would have tainted any of the proceeds and made them taxable, pulled them back into the taxable estate. So yes, you can still put money into an islet um, and it is not a wealth transfer issue and it doesn't taint anything for the estate tax. Okay, great. Tammy, thank you. Yeah, I you bet. I mean, here I was thanking you for your great insight, and then I just threw a couple singers your way. So thank you to the audience. For no, keeping yeah. Um, and as always, thank you to the audience for engaging. We love doing this with you and really hope these sessions continue to be impactful. Thanks to the live stream team, and we look forward to seeing all of you in two weeks when we come back together. Until then, have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon.